Hello and welcome back to another video guys. I know it has been a long time since my last video. Sincere apologies for that. In this video I want to show you how I built this $10,000 deep learning workstation which is an insane amount of money but obviously it's a very powerful deep learning workstation that I have in my hands right now and yeah let's just jump right into it. Before we start I want to share two things with you. First showing you how I built my deep learning workstation means that there are many more videos to come in the near future so in case you're interested in a certain topic just let me know in the comments and I will look into it and second I've started a collaboration with NVIDIA, which is also part of the reason why I'm creating this video. And yeah, more on that later in the video. And now let's get back to how I actually built my deep learning workstation. And for this, first of all, a lot of planning is needed. I read a bunch of blog articles and watched YouTube videos to gather some information on how to decide on a certain component or like which criteria is important for a certain component. And since there are like very extensive guides out there and very extensive articles, my intention with this video is to summarize that so that you get a very concise guide highlighting the most important aspects to building your own deep learning workstation. For this I will first show you how to pick the right component for your setup, then I will show you how I assembled my whole deep learning workstation and as a third step I will show you how I installed the software so I could start running models on my workstation. When it comes to building your own deep learning workstation, there is no way around PC Power Picker because it's such a helpful tool to organize your build. For example, here you can see my build. It shows you all the individual components needed to build your own deep learning workstation. Then it also shows you the prices and also where you can get that component for the cheapest price. And one feature that I really liked about PC Power Picker is you can see the compatibility of individual components. So here for example you can see that I still have two free memory slots and could increase my RAM afterwards or I could add an additional SSD and on top of that you can also get inspiration by other users sharing their builds with you. So it's a super valuable website to organize building your own deep learning workstation. All right, let's start with the most important component, the GPU. While the GPU most likely will make up the majority of your cost, it is also the most important component for a powerful deep learning workstation because during inference or fine tuning or training, ideally all the computation is done using the GPU. But how to choose the right GPU? For this, from my research and understanding, there are three main features to look out for, which are the tensor cores, the memory bandwidth and the GPU memory. And let's start with the tensor cores. Why are they so important? And I found this very nice explanation by Tim Detmers explaining tensor cores are tiny cores that perform very efficient matrix multiplication. Since the most expensive part of any deep neural network is matrix multiplication, tensor cores are very useful. And fast, they are so powerful that I do not recommend any GPUs that do not have tensor cores. And I think all the GPUs that Nvidia has released in the last four to five years already had tensor cores. So only the really old ones don't have tensor cores. And while tensor cores are very important for fast computation, we still need to make sure that our data is transferred to those processing units, to those tensor cores in time. And for this, the memory bandwidth is very important. So Tim Detmers in another example described here that tensor cores during a GPT-3 size training have a utilization of about 45 to 65%, meaning that even for the large neural network, about 50% of the time, tensor cores are idle. And this kind of highlights why high memory bandwidth is important so that we can move our data very fast to their processing units, the tensor cores. And the last feature that I would recommend you watching out for is the VRAM or GPU memory, which kind of determines what kind of AI models you're able to load with you. GPU. So the VRAM can really be a buzzkill for working with certain AI models. So definitely make sure to assess beforehand how much VRAM you will need for your purposes and then get a GPU that at least fulfills your VRAM requirements. And also keep in mind that in recent years, scaling laws have been more and more explored. So bigger corporations have used more compute and more data to train bigger models and to be able to use such models, you also usually need a lot of VRAM. And Tim Detmer has also had a nice heuristic for this, which can help as a guidance. So if you're planning to do image generation, having a GPU with at least 12 gigabytes of VRAM would be recommended. And if you're planning to working with transformers, even more VRAM is recommended having at least 24 gigabytes of VRAM or more. Having this knowledge, now it's time to actually choose a GPU. And for this, I have very exciting news because I started a collaboration with Nvidia and Nvidia was kind enough to support my channel with this RTX 6000 GPU, which is really cool. With that, I can 
create many more videos in the future, train models myself or fine tune large language models, for example, the 70 billion Llama 2 model, which is very exciting. So shout out to Nvidia and many thanks for giving me this GPU. And with all this excitement, I almost forgot to actually mention the stats or the specs of this GPU. So this GPU has 48 gigabytes of VRAM, it has 568 tensor cores, and it has a memory bandwidth of 960 gigabytes per second, which is also very nice. So this GPU is definitely a really, really high-end piece, and I'm very grateful that Nvidia sent me one to support my channel. And if you want more information about this GPU, I will link it down in the description box. And here Tim Detmer has also showed in a very nice graph the relative performance of different GPUs, giving you an idea of how much VRAM each GPU has and their individual names. And as you can see, he only investigated NVIDIA GPUs. I know I'm now doing a collaboration. But honestly, I think all other manufacturers like AMD or Intel are maybe offering GPUs that have similar or slightly worse specs than those NVIDIA GPUs. But the major issue at the moment is that all major AI libraries rely on NVIDIA drivers to accelerate their GPUs for deep learning. So it's sometimes not even the hardware or the GPU itself, but it's the software that makes all the NVIDIA GPUs outstanding and more or less the only option at the moment. And that's also why Tim Detmos, for example, here only compared NVIDIA GPUs. And yeah, I would just recommend you checking out this graph and I will also link this article as well as all the other helpful sources in the description box. And he also shows another graph which maybe is even more relevant for you guys. So here he has the relative performance per US dollar. So definitely also make sure to check out this graph and depending on your budget, I would recommend you to pick the one that fits your budget but achieves the highest performance in here because I think that can definitely be a helpful source to deciding on what GPU to buy. The CPU is probably a component where you will spend way more money on than you actually need to. And this is because almost all the computation is done on the GPU. So the CPU's job is more or less really just to transfer data to the GPU memory or the VRAM and to help pre-processing input data. And for this reason, from my understanding, there are only two criteria that I would recommend you to look for. And the first is that you have at least four cores per GPU. So for example, if you have a four GPU setup, you would need at least a 16 core CPU. And the second one is to have a sufficient amount of PCIe lanes, which one GPU ideally requires 16 PCIe lanes and one NVM express drive requires four additional lines. But for this, I also found that Tim Detmers in his blog post that we saw earlier argued that having this many PCIe lanes is not even necessary and you only have a minor performance degradation of a few percent if you have less than the ideal amount of PCIe lanes in your system. So I would recommend you don't get carried away too much by the PCIe lanes and just get a CPU that's powerful enough also for everyday purposes to use your system, but also don't spend too much money on the CPU because really the GPU is the most important piece when it comes to deep learning performance. And for this reason, I got this Intel i9 CPU of the 13th generation. I know there are also very nice AMD processors out there. I had different builds and I just figured out that using this i9 processor is the cheaper option. But I think as of right now, either with AMD or with Intel, you can't really go wrong. It seems like Intel is a little bit cheaper. While I saw in the community, AMD is a little bit more favored. For the RAM or your memory, I would give you the following advice. And I forgot to mention that with the CPU, once you have decided to buy a certain GPU, all the other components are more or less dependent on the GPU or the GPUs you've got. So, so you buy all the other pieces around your GPU to kind of form a well-round setup. And for the RAM, I would advise you to buy at least as much RAM as your largest GPU has VRAM. Also, don't get carried away by clock rates which sometimes are used to sell RAM for higher prices. And a third thing, if you're unsure how much RAM you actually need, just keep in mind that you can still add RAM later. It's very easy to add on your motherboard at a later time. So maybe first get as much as you think you need at least. And if that's not enough, just buy more. For the RAM, I got this Corsair Venegan 64 gigabytes. Hope you can see it kind of, can my camera zoom in? Yeah, here you can see it. I saw in many different builds that this kind of memory was used, so I also went for it and I'm pretty sure it will be perfectly fine. With the motherboard, 
compatibility is key. You want to make sure that your motherboard is compatible with your CPU, including the number of PCIe lanes that your CPU supports. Also, obviously, you want to make sure that your motherboard is compatible with the GPU or GPUs that you've bought. And for this, just keep in mind that some GPUs take up more space than you initially would think. For example, the very popular RTX 3090 or 4090 are really like heavy GPUs, let's say. So they can take up two neighboring PCIe slots. Just keep that in mind when you select the motherboard. And as a last thing, the motherboard obviously also should support the amount of RAM that you're planning on having. Yeah, and I actually bought this ASRock 790. How can I show it to you guys? <laughs> It's actually a new practice for me to show articles in my videos. So I bought this ASRock Z7090M Phantom Gaming Lightning motherboard. Um, not much to say about it. It's just compatible with the CPU, with the GPU, also with the NVM Express memory and with the RAM. I bought 64 gigabytes of RAM and still have two empty slots. So I could add up to 128 gigabytes of RAM if I wanted. And that's basically all I have to say about this motherboard. When it comes to storage and drives, so many different approaches. I would recommend you to get one OS drive, which ideally is an NVM Express SSD, which are just the fastest. Maybe go for a one or two terabyte one. So you could even store some model checkpoints or code. I saw also other people getting a separate NVMe Express drive for code and checkpoints, which might be an overkill or not necessary, but it fastens up your workflow for sure. And if you're planning on training larger models and using bigger data sets, you definitely also need additional storage, for example, using an HDD or SSD, while HDDs are usually half the price or definitely way cheaper. Tim Detmers also argues in his blog post that while the GPU is computing current batches, the next batch can basically be fetched from the drive and the speed up gained by using an SSD isn't really relevant because the computation takes longer than the fetching of the data anyway. So that way you can also use HDDs for storing your data sets. But in practical terms, I actually often saw people using SSDs also for storing their data sets. So I'm not 100% sure on this one. I probably would get an SSD just to be on the safe end. And yeah, as my OS drive, I got this Samsung 9080 Pro NVM Express drive, which you can see here. Super fast. Yeah, definitely will be a charm using this drive as my OS drive. And then for data sets, I got an 8 terabyte SSD, which is Uno Flip. Amazon, I don't know, I think this uh, I think this was a scam. Sent me uh, this Uno Flip instead of the SSD, so now I have to return this. Um, yeah, well, I'm a little bit unlucky, I guess, on this end, so have to uh, wait to get a replacement SSD and I will add this to my computer after I've got it. To run all the components, we need power. And for that, we need a power supply unit or short PSU. And there's actually not much to say. I, I found a really nice rule of thumb, which is helpful to find the perfect PSU for your purposes. And this is 1.1 times the CPU wattage needed plus the GPU wattage needed. For example, for my use case, the CPU needs a max wattage of 253 and the GPU a max wattage of 300. So in total, using this formula, we get a, around 608. And for this reason, to leave some extra room, I bought this Corsair RM840X PSU to leave some extra room. So this PSU can accommodate a total of 850 watts. And actually it's pretty heavy. <laughs> With the case, you should pay attention to two things. First, obviously, all of your components should fit in, especially the GPUs, which tend to be the biggest component in your whole build, especially if you want to accommodate multiple GPUs within your case. It's often a good idea to get a really big case so you have more space and potentially a better airflow within your case. And this also brings me to the second thing you should pay attention to, which are the thermals. Even though this is less important, depending on what kind of case you're buying, the inside temperature of your case can be decreased by a few degrees. I bought this Fractal Meshify 2 mini case, which, yeah, <laughs> actually it doesn't look all that mini in the video, but comparatively is mini. I wanted to just have a single GPU system, so that's why I opted for a mini case, which is very concise, cute. I can just put it under the table. Nothing special, has a glass window. I like the design, it's pretty simple and doesn't take up too much space. For the CPU cooler, there's really not much to say. The only thing is your CPU cooler should keep your CPU cool so you don't run in any temperature issues with your CPU. And for this, I bought this Nocturne NH-U12A CPU cooler, which I checked their website. It's sufficient for the Intel i9 I choose. And also 
since I have a mini case, I needed to make sure that this CPU cooler fits into my case. And to allow a higher airflow inside my mini case, I also bought those two case fans, which are called Noctura NF A12. Not even sure if I need them. Potentially, if I get issues with the thermals inside my mini case, I can even upgrade and add more to the case. Um, but this is just for the start. All right, now that we have planned and bought all necessary components, it's time to assemble the workstation. And I've already shown you all the components that I've bought. And as a first step of assembling, I will install the CPU on the motherboard. And for some reason, this is always the part that makes me the most nervous. I guess that's just because it's such a small and in a way fragile piece. You really don't want to mess up the conductors on the back when you mount the CPU into the CPU socket on the motherboard. Next, it's time to install the RAM on the motherboard. For that, just make sure that you plug in the RAM in the right direction and that the RAM locker basically snaps back into its default position. Next, we install the NVM Express SSD, which is super easy, as you can see, and more or less just requires to tighten a screw. When I had to install the CPU cooler, I more or less messed up for the first time because I first mounted the motherboard inside the case and then realized that I had to install a piece of the CPU cooler at the back of the motherboard. And for that, I had to unscrew the whole motherboard and take it out of the case again to then install that support piece on the back of the motherboard. And then again, had to mount the motherboard inside the case. So to summarize that, I definitely would recommend you to check out beforehand if you have to install anything on the back of your motherboard for your CPU cooler. All right, now that the motherboard looks pretty crowded, it's time to mount it and this time I definitely didn't need to unscrew it again because that's definitely a part that also made me nervous yet yeah, to kind of make the motherboard fit into the mini case and also tighten in all the screws of the motherboard because with the CPU cooler it was already hard to reach certain points. Then it's time to supply our motherboard, our CPU and other components with power. And for that, we need to install the power supply unit, the PSU. And here it can only give you one advice. Make sure to plan beforehand which components you need to supply with power with so you can already plug in all the necessary cables so once your PSU is fitted inside your case you don't need to plug in any additional cables that you haven't thought about in advance. Now it's time to mount the case fans which is a pretty straightforward task. You just need to make sure to mount the case fans onto your case using screws and then find the right plug on your motherboard to supply the case fan with power. Alright, time for the grand finale adding the GPU to your motherboard and that's the last piece basically that we are adding. And here again just make sure to supply the GPU with power and then mount it on a PCIe slot on your motherboard and that's more or less it. Alright time to wrap things up and close the case. <laughs> yeah not much more to say after we have installed all the components now it's time to close our case and start setting up the workstation. Alright now that we have Finished assembling our deep learning workstation, it's time to install all the necessary software so we can start running our deep learning models. All right, for this we first need to download an Ubuntu distribution by visiting ubuntu.com slash download. And here you can click on the download Ubuntu desktop version. So here we go. And then I will just download the first version that's shown here, which is the latest LTS version of Ubuntu and just click the download button here. Then we also need to download Belina Etcher, which allows you to flash OS images to SD cards or USB drives safely and easily, which is perfect. And this software is open source. You can also see it supports Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. And for doing so, I would recommend you to just click on this download link, visit their website, and already download the Etcher application just by clicking this button and then downloading the application by clicking the download button here for your system and I will go with Mac OS. Then you can see I have downloaded both files and I will open the Bellina Etcher application by double clicking it, dragging it to the application folder and then I press command space, Etcher, click this application. And now I can then select flash from file, which we already saw in the Ubuntu OS. That's, this is where I saved the ISO file, the Ubuntu OS 
ISO file. And then I need to select the target, which is in USB drive or an SD card. And here I'm selecting this device. And yeah, that's basically it. Now we can press the flash button and that's all it takes to make our USB drive or SD card bootable. All right, and now it's time to boot the workstation for the first time, a very exciting moment. So all we need is a monitor and a keyboard, optionally a mouse, and obviously also our boot drive, which is the USB drive or SD card. And with that, we can install Ubuntu on the workstation. All right, now let's first switch on the power button on the PSU, then hit the power button on our workstation, then make sure to plug in your bootable OS drive, and then hit the enter button to start installing Ubuntu. And then I fast forwarded the process of installing Ubuntu, which took me maybe like 10 to 15 minutes in real time. Then I decided to use Lambda Stack to install all drivers that are necessary to run AI models using the GPU. And Lambda Stack makes it super easy for you because you just need to run one single command. And for this, I just opened the Lambda Stack website, scrolled down, copied the command, opened the terminal in Ubuntu, and then just pasted the command into the terminal and just pressed enter. Then I had to type in my password and that's all it took to install all necessary drivers to run AI models on your GPU. Once the installation process is done, which took around seven to 10 minutes for me, we just need to reboot our system. And this can be done by typing in sudo reboot. To verify that everything worked out, we can type in NVIDIA minus SMI to check if the NVIDIA drivers got installed properly and if our GPU gets listed in the driver overview. Then to double check, we can open the Python interpreter by typing Python and pressing enter. Then we import torch to make sure if the PyTorch installation also worked. And then we can type in torch.cuder dot is available to check if a GPU is available and we can see it's true. So our GPU got detected. And then we can also type in torch.cuder dot get device, uh, get device name to see if, uh, to just see the name of our GPU and this is the one that I <laughs> installed. So that's perfect. And now I can use the GPU to run AI models, which is very exciting. All right, guys, and that's it for today's video. I hope you learned something new. I hope you enjoyed watching it. And I'm really excited to now get going with a new workstation to try some new models to maybe fine tune certain models or even train new models because it allows me to do so much more. And yeah, if you have any ideas of what I should look into, just let me know in the comments and I'm looking forward to see you in the next video. And until then, have a good time. Bye bye.